All right, you guys ready? <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much for joining us. Good evening. My name is Michelle Wilson, and I am the Neighborhood Training and Development Program Manager with the City of Charlotte Community Engagement. Welcome so much. We thank you for being with us. I popped a couple things in the chat for you all. Um, just as a reminder, we do record these sessions. So this session will be recorded and it will be available on our training on demand page. Um, and so I'll pop that link into the chat as well. That'll be available in about two weeks. Uh, we will also share presentation slides. So the slides that you see tonight, um, we'll save a PDF copy for you all and we will send that to you via email tomorrow. And let me see, check my other notes. So tonight you are joining us for insurance and risk management for neighborhood associations and HOAs. And we are joined by Rocky Cavanaugh. And Rocky has been so gracious to be with us, I don't know, probably for the last couple of months on some really heavy topics to really help you all as HOA leaders or neighborhood association leaders to better um, govern and to better oversee what you are doing for your neighborhoods. And so we thank you so much, Rocky, for being with us. If you um, aren't familiar, Rocky is an attorney with Hull and Chandler, PA. And so we have some great knowledge that he's going to share with us tonight. So I will turn it over to you, Rocky. All right. Well, let me go ahead and get the uh, uh, PowerPoint up here. <clears throat> and uh, start from the beginning. Sorry. Right. Can everybody see um, the, uh, the PowerPoint? Yes, it's showing. Okay, excellent. All right, everybody. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, joining us here on a Tuesday night. There's so many things that you could be doing on a Tuesday night um, other than, um, you know, sitting through uh, sort of a, a legal discussion uh, seminar on insurance and risk management basics for your neighborhood association or homeowner association. Um, let me make sure I've got here. Okay, here we go. All right. So I applaud each and every one of you for, for coming out because, A, it just shows that you care about your respective neighborhood association or homeowner association to want to, you know, spend a Tuesday night learning something where you could be, you know, watching television or taking a walk or something, but we'll make it worth your while. We'll definitely uh, get you some information. And again, as Michelle said, uh, this will be recorded and put on the Neighborhood Housing Services website on, with the City of Charlotte website. And also the slides um, <clears throat> will be made available for you to reference. Um, now, speaking of these slides, I wouldn't be a lawyer if I hadn't uh, put the, my disclaimer here. So just remember, nothing in this presentation is, is really meant to create any kind of attorney-client relationship. If you take the slides and you start applying it, this is a disclaimer that none of the topics here created any kind of relationship between myself or my firm and, and you. This is purely informational. Um, and uh, this is really to give you questions to go and ask an attorney or you know, at least get, get you thinking about um, things. Really, more importantly, uh, questions you should ask an insurance broker. I think really that's, if there's gonna be a takeaway from today's discussion is um, just how important uh, an insurance broker is uh, for uh, your nonprofit, you know, I mean, my nonprofit, your homeowner association or, or uh, neighborhood association and, and your needs. So really, I think in some respects, vetting and having the right insurance agent is gonna be key uh, even more so than, than, than having legal counsel in this regard. Yeah, actually, having legal counsel is what happens when you something messes up <laughs> on that back end. Okay, so let's do an overview of today's presentation. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to review uh, types of relevant insurance policies, common types. So uh, we're going to do kind of a you know a thousand foot view, fifty thousand foot view of some of these um, uh, types of policies that your organization uh, could purchase. Um, we're then gonna spend a little time dissecting a sample policy because and this would actually help you out just in your sort of regular day life because everybody buys insurance um, at some point in your life, whether it's car insurance or homeowner's insurance. Um, <clears throat> this will help you out, but this can also help out your organization. I made an entire block here on working with an insurance broker agent. 
That's, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this because I think that if you have the right insurance broker agent who understands the space that you're in, um, I think that a lot of potential liabilities and problems are, are easily um, taken care of because then you will have the right policies and the right coverages that, um, that you need for your organization. And then a couple of miscellaneous issues, but really, um, you know, that's, that's it. So uh, hold on, let me see, we've got some stuff here in the chat. So I'll make sure that, okay. Uh, all right, it's just, uh, it's just, uh, okay. All right, so let's go ahead and review some common types of insurance policies that could be purchased by either a neighborhood association or a homeowner association. Now, there are some distinct differences between uh, neighborhood associations and, and homeowner associations, uh, but I think one of the core uh, things that are similar, they're both uh, typically organized as nonprofit corporations under, uh, under here in North Carolina law. Um, and so a lot of this, and a lot of, and both organizations are driven by typically boards of directors that, that are accountable to a, a certain set of membership. But, um, you know, I think that, that uh, a lot of these types of insurance will cover both types of organizations. Um, and, and in some respects, um, there are probably even hyper marketed um, products in the insurance market for HOAs, particularly because um, under North Carolina, and we talked about this at previous trainings, is that under the North Carolina Plan Community uh, Act, um, homeowner associations are required by law to carry certain types of insurance coverage, particularly on um, property owned in common areas um, and, and some other areas. But so we'll, I think it'd be really important to know um, what uh, types of insurance policies to carry. Again, note, um, some of the insurance we won't be talking about because, I mean, and again, this really uh, isn't necessarily um, uh, required for, for uh, either of your organizations, but, uh, you know, because you are nonprofits, this would kind of apply if you did have employees or, or, or such. So we won't be talking about workers' comp or, or health insurance um, in this. <clears throat> all right, so let's start with talk with sort of the, uh, the granddaddy of them all, um, sort of the the, one of the more primary um, insurance policies that one would get for your business. And then really, in some respects, think of your organization as somewhat of a business, right? I mean, you, you, many of you might be business owners um, because you are uh, doing activities. Now, are you making a lot of money for yourselves and making a lot of profit? No, not particularly, particularly if you're a neighborhood association, but you are doing things in the community, you're doing things in the environment that could leave yourself avail, uh, uh, prone to uh, injuring a third party. And, um, and so what commercial general liability insurance is there is for, should you ever harm a third party through either your activities as a homeowner association or your activities as a, uh, a neighborhood association? So, um, so the three major components under C, your typical CGL, and the thing is, when you talk to your broker about commercial general liability insurance, pretty much uh, most CGL policies use a standardized 16-page, the ISO CGL coverage form. Um, and so it really, again, like I said, CGL is, is just intended to pay for unintended, okay? So if, you, <laughs> if you're having an event and your board chair you know, just punches somebody out, CGL is not going to cover that, right? Because that's, 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 an, that's an intentional injury to a third party. Or if you, you know, uh, you, you, you throw uh, something, a, a concrete block at somebody's car at an event, um, that's intentional damage to property. So CGL is for accidents, right? So somebody trips and falls and twists their ankle, you know, at one of your events or, or, or something like that, then that's what CGL would, would come in there. And so as a second um, bullet area says, you know, CGL will pay for unintended injuries to third parties and damage to properties belonging to third parties. 
Um, it'll include investigation and legal defense of claims by said third parties against your nonprofit, um, which would usually be negligence or negligent supervision suits. So the nice thing about insurance is that not only will it help settle it, most insurance carriers will go and hire an attorney to try to get you out of that or try to, you know, settle the claim. Um, um, so it doesn't, you know, obviously it's going to raise your premium, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's better to have a raised premium than, you know, owe, you know, $50 million or something like that. Now, so again, this covers bodily injury, property damage, uh, medical payments coverage if someone obviously has to hospital because of an accident happens under your sort of watch, um, personal injury, advertising injury. That's definitely more in the commercial business area. Uh, your organizations may not necessarily uh, really need the advertising injury liability. Um, so who is covered? So this is important. Um, the nonprofit officer. So many of you might be sitting on your board. Um, so uh, you would be covered, um, directors, uh, volunteers and employees acting within the scope of duties. Now that's really important to know um, because a lot of times you're doing events and you've got volunteers involved, you know, uh, acting on behalf of the neighborhood association or acting on behalf of the homeowner association, more likely on the neighborhood association side. <clears throat> but still, it's good to know that if you had CGL, that it would cover any kind of accidents caused uh, by any of these individuals. Again, what CGL doesn't cover, right? So these are exclusions. And we'll talk about how to read for exclusions when we dissect the typical insurance policy in a little bit. But number one, if you have commercial general liability, it's not going to cover intentional injuries. We, we, in law school, we call them torts. Uh, these were non, with, you know, they were non-criminal uh, injuries that were still compensable, right? So assault and battery that aren't, you know, prosecuted by the state or prosecuted by somebody else, like. Someone, someone's dog bites you, you know, it's not the cops there. You're usually suing them in small claims court, right? That's a tort, right? Um, here's an important one here in the second bullet area. Tort liability of another party by contractual agreement or indemnification. Now, this might actually be important for, I think particularly the, for nonprofits, particularly like neighborhood associations, if you get into an agreement, you know, maybe... Um, you do a partnership with the city, you do a partnership with a foundation. Invariably, in your agreement, there will probably be what they call it, a mutual indemnification clause that says if something happens that you will protect or defend another party. Well, CGL is not going to pony up that money to protect another person for, from a third party harm. They're only going to protect you for a third party harm. So even if you put it in a contract and you sign it, uh, there have been a lot of lawsuits over, over this, but typically your, um, your carrier is going to resist ponying up insurance money, even though you have agreed to uh, defend another party for an accident, they're gonna say, we only defend you from accidents, not other people. Um, other things that CGL won't um, cover you know, uh, violations of minimum wage, breach of contract, um, and of course, injuries suffered by employees during the scope of employment. That's what workers' comp is for. Um, so a quick example of how a, a CGL claim suit would go. Um, so if you look at this first one, you have a commercial general liability uh, policy. It provides two valuable forms of coverage. One, payment of defense costs and indemnity protection. So those are two really good things to have. So let's say on a second, we go to this next arrow. So the plaintiff files a suit against the, your nonprofit for a loss covered by the policy. So let's example, an attendee at say Unity in the Community event breaks their ankle, tripping on some bundled up electrical cords leading to the main stage. Maybe you had some folks uh, doing some music and someone trips and they twist their ankle real horribly and, um, they want to make a claim against the event promoters, which would say, let's say it's the neighborhood association put on the event. Um, they want to make a claim against it, against you, and you want to find out if you have commercial general liability insurance for it. Um, the insurance carrier will then hire a law firm to defend your neighborhood association in the lawsuit. 
And hopefully a lot of times uh, the insurance people, you know, they tend to get in there and they try to settle things. So they're not really interested in litigating a lot of times. They, they'll see if they can um, uh, get the person to agree to take an amount of money, sign a release and walk away. But if they, it continues into court and the insurance people are there to continue fighting it, um, and you go to court and you're found liable for this injury to this uh, person who attended your community event and hurt themselves, um, if the nonprofit is found liable at trial for a covered loss, so covered loss would be something like this, um, or if a settlement agreement can be reached, the insurance company pays the judgment or the settlement amount. So that's the nice thing. So if the insurance is there, it's a covered event, either you lose and the insurance person pays it, or you get a settlement and the insurance uh, carrier pays it. Now that obviously is going to matter if if the amount that's settled for or the amount that you lose by is under um, the limits of the coverage. And we'll talk about what limits in the coverage are when we dissect the policy. Um, just remember that these claims are always subject to your nonprofit, you know, meeting the policy deductible. So higher deductibles, you know, I mean, they you health insurance, you understand what high deductible is, um, but. Uh, you know, you've got to be able to hit that. Um, so you got to meet your policy deductible. So maybe passing around the hat if the policy deductible is $25,000 before the protection will kick in. Um, so you want to also make sure um, that the deductible isn't super high given the sort of organization that you have. Um, and that the limits of the coverage being more than the settlement judgment amount. Because again, we talk about limits. If you've got a $1 million limit and um, you settle for $2 million, the insurance is only going to pay a million, you're going to have to come up with the other million, right? So you always got to make sure that whatever, you know, that your coverages are high enough to, to uh, meet whatever liabilities or settlements you may, you may have to hit. All right, so I'm going to take a little kind of detour here. For those of you who are in homeowner associations, because uh, because uh, the market knows that homeowner associations, A, are created by statute and by statute have to have um, insurance and, uh, you know, homeowner, uh, you know, associations can tend to somewhat self-fund themselves a lot better than most neighborhood associations, um, that uh, there are many carriers that carry something available called HOA master policies, and I put in front of the value coverage. So, so this is kind of a combo. And so I think that when you talk to your agent, um, then you say, well, I represent the, uh, you know, XYZ homeowner association. Um, you want to find out, you know, A, do you have a master policy? And so what a master policy will do is it bundles several coverages under one premium. So that thing I just talked about, general liability, commercial general liability, that would be part of the bundle. It's kind of like, you know, like Spectrum. Spectrum is always trying to get you to purchase a bundle. It's like, I just want internet. No, you can have a phone and you can have the TV, but I, I do Roku. You know, they, they want to bundle it all together to give you more value. Well, these master policies will bundle different types of coverages all under one premium, right? You know, so under this bundled HOA master policy, uh, you know, you could have property. We'll talk a little bit about property coverage for common areas, building coverage. You know, some of the HOAs may have, you know, may have like one building, like a condo building or something. You may have to have uh, some coverage on the building, even though you don't own the individual units in the building. Um, and of course, general liability, obviously the previous set of slides and, and, and it will also carry directors and officers liability. And we're going to talk about DNO next. So all of you are in nonprofits. I mean, if you are in an HOA that uh, was formed after 1999, you are clearly in a nonprofit. And most neighborhood associations are either incorporated as nonprofits or are unincorporated nonprofit associations who just hadn't gotten around to doing the paperwork. So why is DNO insurance important? Because all nonprofits have a board of directors. There are always, now most of you are all volunteers. You're not getting paid to, but you are sitting on 
uh, like these boards of directors. And if you are interested, there is a, uh, a previous presentation that is on the archive of Neighborhood Housing Services. I think it's called Serving on an HOA Board, uh, where we talk a little bit more about fiduciary duties. And I think I even also spent some time talking about directors and officer insurance and that. But what is DNO? So DNO protects the nonprofit from claims alleging wrongful management decisions. And so whether it's the wrongful decisions by the board, um, you know, most of the time DNO does come from like an aggrieved employee or a former employee, but it can come from an aggrieved volunteer. So that's why even though, well, we, we, you know, none of us have employees, yeah, but maybe if you utilize a lot of volunteers, um, you could do something that could trigger uh, the need to have DNO insurance. Um, again, DNO is usually nonprofits that have uh, our best. It's, it's really important once your nonprofit has employees in particular to have DNO. But like I said, there have been cases that have extended, uh, you know, um, the sort of relationship between a board and a volunteer as somewhat similar between the board and an employee. And so really a lot of times where this comes is that the employee does something terrible, um, you know, like uh, does something and then the, the lawsuit is blaming the board for hiring or allowing said employee or volunteer to to be in the mix, to be involved in the in, in and so the DNO insurance will protect those individual directors from any kind of personal liability. Um, and again, it typically applies to decisions made by your volunteer board, past, present, and future, right? So you come on the board, you better hope there's a DNO insurance in there that at least if somebody says, hey, something happened to me in 2017, you didn't even know about the association, but at least there's DNO insurance in there that will retroactively cover, you know, those type of claims. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you this, many people I know, myself included, don't join nonprofit boards unless they have DNO insurance, just because you never know. Um, a little bit more about DNO directors and office insurance is that, uh, like I said here, many people won't join a nonprofit without proof that the nonprofit carries DNO. Um, and here's this is according to the Nonprofit Risk Management Center. It's a really great um, resource you know, for uh, risk management and nonprofit sector. Each insurance carrier writes its own DNO policy, resulting in substantial differences among insurers. So you got to read your policy confirm with your agent or broker. I'm gonna show you how to read your policy in a little bit, but compare that to commercial general liability insurance, which I said is everybody uses sort of the same 16 page ISO um, uh, CGL form. DNO can vary, can be extremely different from carrier to carrier. Um, of course, one tip, always know what your deductible is. Um, I know um, when I ran a nonprofit, the DNO deductible is $25,000. So if there was ever a claim and we need to get the defense of the DNO to kick in, uh, the organization would need to pay or, you know, have to, you know, have $25,000 taken out uh, first, you know, by the, by the company. Um, and tip, if you do change the DNO policy carriers, just make sure there's, uh, that the policy doesn't include a no prior acts exclusion or has a retro. What I mean is, Again, a lot of times people change insurance carriers, right? Uh, you know, somebody comes in and says, oh, you get a better uh, premium if you go with this carrier. So I said, well, I'm not gonna renew with XYZ carrier. I'm gonna go to this new one, ABC. Well, you go to ABC, you didn't read the fine print and it says, we don't, we're only going to insure you for things that happen now. We're not going to cover, you know, anything that happened before. And so somebody comes with an old claim and then your insurance company starts playing, pointing the finger saying, oh, we're not responsible for it. And somehow, you know, you, you could be kind of wrecked with that. So, um, and again, when we talk about, when we talk about uh, how important your, your, your agent is, because as you're gonna see, we're not all trained to just read policies and we don't have time to read all these policies. But your agents and your brokers do. And I think it's going to be really important to have the right agent and broker that is in your space um, guiding you with, um, with these, these questions that, uh, and, 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 and kind of guiding you towards 
the right policies and the right carriers to go with. Um, something that, you know, um, should be particularly neighborhood associations. Now, we talked about general commercial general liability insurance. Now, commercial general liability insurance is usually for the whole year, right? It's for a, an entire period. And CGL in itself is really good for organizations that tend to do more than, you know, tend to do weekly activities or even monthly activities. But if your organization it really only does one event, maybe the only thing you really need is special event coverage. You know, you have one big unity in the community event each year that's going to draw thousands or at least hundreds of people new into your neighborhood for uh, some kind of event. Well, um, this type of event coverage, it, it, it protects the organization planning a community event from a variety of potential mishaps. Um, so this coverage only either covers a date or maybe a few days around it, like a period surrounding the date of your planned event. So I think this covered, this has general liability insurance. So like all that stuff that we talked about, you know, the accidents, the unintended injuries to third parties. So if somebody trips on the cord or somebody's car gets hit by another car or something at your event, then this would, you know, be there to cover it. Um, some of these special event policy, you know, coverages may uh, carry liquor liability. That's if you, you know, you're serving alcohol, um, you know, at your event and, you know, minor gets a hold of it or, or, or something, you know, that is there. Um, and of course, a really important one, cancellation insurance. This was really big during COVID. Well, I mean, I guess to some extent it's probably still, still viable now. Um, cancellation, it's used to protect you in case cancellation due to unforeseen circumstances such as foul weather or, or COVID, <laughs> you know. Um, this usually covers loss of deposits and costs already paid in advance. That's if you're like booking a uh, convention center or something like that and something happens, then, you know, you can at least get your money back that you put down, you know, that you put down um, trying to book a, a venue for your special event or something. And of course, another thing that's part of this would be hired non-owned auto liability covers vehicle damage to vehicles rented for the event and injury to a third party. So that kind of plays in with the, the general liability um, insurance as well. But I think real important is that if you do have if your neighborhood association or your homeowner association, for that matter, hold some kind of really big time special event, you know, kind of a you know, come one, come all sort of thing, you may want to consider special event coverage. Um, it, it, it maybe even in addition, if even if you are carrying commercial general liability insurance, you want to get a little extra, like a booster, you want to get a little extra coverage for that particular event. Um, because then um, you, you could have more uh, coverage because your risk uh, expands when you have a special event versus if you, all you're doing is just your day to day activities. And uh, be remiss without talking about umbrella or excess liability coverage. Um, so, and we'll talk about what limits are in a second, but umbrella and excess liability coverage, these policies provide legal liability coverage um, for various types of injuries that happen during the policy. It basically provides, and that's why it's an umbrella, it provides an additional layer of security to existing liability policies. So, when the underlying policy limits are reached, the umbrella policy drops down to four additional limits. So if under your CGL and you have a million, but you've got an umbrella of 2 million, you know, and you had to settle with somebody for 1.5 million, you hit your limit on the one, your umbrella drops down, you get the extra 500,000. It's always, it's kind of an extra, it's like an extra, um, you know, boost. And so I know that um, and I think there's a, there's a saying, it's kind of like, um, how much should I be insured for? Um, how much can you afford to be insured, right? So that's really the key. I think um, there's really, if, if you have all the money in the world, you should try to insure yourself from everything. But, you know, again, nobody has all the money in the world. And so, you know, as much as you can afford, and I think if you've got the right agent who's in that space, who knows you know, have been around the block quite a few times, you know, they'll know what you need to prioritize as far as um, your insurance premium and, and the coverages that you choose go. 
Um, and of course, there's some things that you can do um, in-house that can reduce your risk, right? So obviously um, you're incorporated that, that limits your liability, but we're talking about risk. Um, you know, having insurance is great risk management. It's great to have it there, but strong nonprofit board governance is truly strong nonprofit risk management. Um, and again, each of you, whether you're an HOA or a home or a neighborhood association, you're set up as a nonprofit. And so if you have very strong board governance, either from a, a board that knows their knows um, the organization and makes the right decisions, that can help reduce your risk. So again, you know, it's really important to have directors of a thorough understanding of their legal and fiduciary duties owed to the nonprofit grantees and donors to, re to reduce risk and exposure to trigger your DNO insurance. Because here's the nice thing is that you may have DNO insurance, but you may not have to ever use DNO insurance if you've got strong board governance. And again, here in North Carolina, um, you've got three fiduciary duties, the duty of care, the duty of loyalty, and the duty of obedience. That goes to each and every one of you who is in a nonprofit whether you're in a neighborhood association or an HOA, you most likely have been formed as a North Carolina nonprofit. You have articles of incorporation somewhere in your records that show this. And if you do, these do apply to you. And again, um, if you wanna learn more about these duties, go to the archives and look up the orientation HOA board service in the training on demand section of the Neighborhood Housing Services website. In this training, I do go over and I do provide a pretty broad, a strong overview of these fiduciary duties for both directors of HOAs and neighborhood association because um, they're both entities subject to North Carolina nonprofit. I know it's kind of geared towards HOA board service, but when I get into that section, I'm talking solely about what affects nonprofit boards and both neighborhood associations and HOA board have to follow those rules. Okay. Uh, all right, so those are so those are sort of common areas of, of uh, common types of insurance that that your neighborhood association or HOA could carry. Um, so I don't know. Do we have any questions right now? Nope, I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, so so what I'm going to do right now is we're going to kind of try to dissect, you see this gentleman here, the picture, he's looking at a large book or a policy. We're going to try to understand the common elements in an insurance policy. So it, it, all insurance policies are kind of broken up the same way. They, they, you know, so if you, you, whether you have a policy for directors and officer insurance, commercial general liability insurance, cyber liability insurance, property insurance, auto insurance, all of these policies are kind of written the same way. They're kind of bracketed the same way. Now, now why should you read your insurance policy? Because it's a contract between your organization and insurance carrier. And uh, you want to ensure that what you need and expect to be covered are actually covered. And um, you also want to know if there are special requirements. We're talking about conditions after you face off what you know, what must be done. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about conditions, but it's really important to read your insurance policy. Now, I know it's, it's one thing, well, nobody reads your insurance policy, we just have it. And again, that's why I kind of say it's really important to have the right insurance agent or broker who knows the space. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about what constitutes a really strong broker or agent, because none of us are reading our insurance policies. We just, you know, we just want to make sure we have it. But should you ever have to read your insurance policy, I'm going to give you some tools here on how to uh, go about that. All right. So these are common policy elements inside of an insurance policy. So like I said, any insurance policy you have. So I'm sure if you've got a homeowner's insurance, many, many of you who are in homeowner uh, associations, I imagine you have homeowner's insurance on the house. Well, your policy is broken down exactly like this. So you got auto insurance, it's broken down and very similarly. I mean, you have something called debt declarations. We'll talk about your debt page, a definition section, insuring agreements, which is the, each of the little chapters and policies, exclusions, which are real important to know, limits, we'll talk about what the limits are, conditions, conditions can trip you up, 
and of course endorsements. So it's a declaration. So this is kind of like the cover sheet of your policy. It's probably one of the most important sheet. It's, it's really a quick way to kind of know what in the world this policy is about. So you, it, they, a lot of times in the industry call it the deck page, right? It's the first page of your insurance policy. And so what it does, it summarizes the important information about your particular policy. So it's sort of an executive summary. It's a, a Cliff Notes version of what's inside your actual policy. So it will have the name or type of coverage provided. So you see this example I have here, this has got commercial liability and liquor liability. So this looks like this might very well be a special event. There it is, business description. This is a special event um, policy. And um, the name of the insured, I don't think that's name is here all because this is kind of a sample, but you would have your name insured, the duration of the policy. So you see the policy here, kind of a short period, right? 905, 2015 to 907, 2015, two day period, right? So special event is a, a very small period of time there, right? But during, if anything happens during that period of time, you would be covered. Uh, the names or numbers of endorsements. Um, so you can see down here, coverage form endorsements. It said C endorsement EOD 195. And then the dollar limits of coverage associated. I know that we've got the premium here, but a lot of times they should have the amounts of, and it might be on page two of this, but you would have the dollar limits of coverage. It might say uh, it has a, um, you know, million dollar coverage and a, uh, $10,000 deductible or something like that. So that's an important thing to have. Um, most of the time, this is really the only page most people ever read is the deck page on either your homeowner insurance or, or whatever. If you're, you know, it's, 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 it's the only thing you're really looking for is, a, you know, whatever the invoice is and you rip it out and you try to check and you just get it, get it over with. Um, so, so that's the deck page. The next section after that deck page, you would, you would open your policy. And you go, oh, here's my deck page. You have definitions. You know, a lot of definitions. They're going to be defining all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, things that you didn't think needed to be defined are being defined in the policy. Now, why is this a big deal? Because there's a thing in Latin called contra preferentum. Uh, it means against the offerer. So what this means is that in a standardized contract, like a insurance carrier policy and if the definition is ambiguous and there's unequal bargaining power the courts will favor the non-drafting party what that means is that in a situation if there's true ambiguity the courts will favor you because you don't have the bargaining power as liberty mutual does right but so that is why the insurance policy carriers painstakingly craft multiple definitions for seemingly everyday terms. So that's why, because they want to define these terms um, because if they don't define it, the court will define it and the court will typically define it in a way that most people see it. Because if it's not defined in the policy, you have to use everyday meaning of the word. That's why, I know it's kind of infuriating, but that's why you have really fat definition sections in these policies and they're in, and they're not defining things that you don't know. They seem to be defining things you know. But if you really read closely, they're defining it in a way that kind of works for them, or at least tries to uh, try to limit what what things could uh, apply to them. So here's an example. So this is from the ISO. I told you it's a typical the ISO commercial general liability definition. So in it, you would find uh, employee. You know. But then it says employee does not include a temporary worker, right? So you can kind of already see where they're kind of even within these definitions, they're making exclusions. Uh, a leased worker is defined here. Remember, you can see here, a leased worker does not include a temporary worker. But then they define a temporary worker. So the temporary worker is furnished to you to substitute for permanent employee on lease. So you can kind of see that there's a lot of definitions that are, that, that are in these sections. I mean, there's a lot. Um, so that, that, that's the second section. We talk about a deck page, and then you're going to have a whole host of definitions that you got to weed through. Um, and a lot of times they can put exclusions in the definitions, but then they have a whole section called exclusions, and we'll get to that. But after you flip the page and get your deck page, your definitions, then we get into actual insuring agreements. So 
these are the area, this is the area of the policy where the insurer is essentially telling you what the policy covers. It defines the scope of coverage. Each insuring agreement will typically be comprised of defined terms. So that's why you have to know what the definitions are, because when you read the insuring agreements, you see a word you think you know, but really they've defined the word way in front in the definition section. So if you're truly in the market for reading your policies deeply, you're going to have to consistently refer back to your definition section to see what words you may think mean something, but they don't. They actually means whatever the definition section says they mean. So, you know, here's some more, and I, I just kind of color coded this, right? Bodily injury, property damage, suit, occurrence, and employee. Just remember the colors here, green, blue, purple, red, and black, right? So let's go look at an insuring agreement. So you can kind of see that you see some green, you see some blue, you see some purple, you see some red. Why? Because every time you see the word bodily injury, it's almost like Simon says or something, you got to go do something, right? You see the word bodily injury, you got to go boom. I got to go back to the definition section and see what that means, because that's what that means, right? Um, oh, property damage. I got to go back and see what property damage means, you know? And they go all the way down, occurrence. What in the world is occurrence means? You have to go all the way back to definitions and see what occurrence means. Because they were acting in a way that they're going to try to weasel their way out of covering you a lot of times. Like, oh, well, it didn't happen under this situation, right? So, um, and a lot of times it just, you know, it, again, I, I, I kind of just keep harping about it. It's really important to have an agent or broker who knows this space very well because they'll know the history of these carriers and what they tend to cover and what they don't. And that's really, you know, you don't, because none of us really have the time to read all these things. I mean, I'm a lawyer. I don't really have time. Well, I'll, I'll have to, I'll make time. You're paying me to read this, but you know, it's, you know, um, most of us, even in our own lives, don't, don't just read these, but just kind of want to give you an idea of what's here. All right. So we've talked about insuring agreements. We've talked about definition sections, exclusion. So you flip through this policy and you get to exclusion. They love exclusions, right? Because this is the section that tells you what is not covered under the policy. Now, again, like I said, a lot of times exclusions can even be found in the definition section, but here's an example of an exclusion. So this would be an exclusion section. So boom, it'll just say, this insurance does not apply to expected, you know, or intended injury or property damage, expected or intended from the standpoint of insurance. And then you see this exclusion does not apply to bodily injuries on the use of reasonable force protect. You see exclusions. I know it gets even more like your brain because what is going on here? Um, but exclusions are, are, are there to kind of tell you what they won't cover. Um, and um, I know, I know it, this is a lot here, but I just want to kind of take you through this deep dive to kind of see sort of how the sausage is made when it comes to a, uh, to, to an insurance policy. Now, the limits, I think, are important to know. Um, and it won't be a lar long page, but it'll just, it's the policy limitations that will provide the dollar reimbursement available under the policy. So um, you can kind of see, this is a commercial general liability. You see the general aggregate limit of a million, but then you can see medical expense limit per person, 25,000. Sometimes limits are expressed in the form of total percentage. I think that any conversation that you have with whoever is brokering or your agent is to have a sober and, 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 and a good understanding of what the limits are and what you could expect kind of damage to happen to the type of organization you are. And again, the type of broker or agent, they have a lot of experience seeing, you know, the lifespan of organizations similar to yours. They do a lot of work in the homeowner associations, you know, they do a lot of work with small nonprofits and neighborhood associations. They should have a better idea of like where your limits, you know, should be. Um, and then of course, conditions. Conditions almost seem like exclusions themselves, right? So these are provisions that, that they don't say they're excluded, but you have to do certain things or you won't get, um, you won't get coverage, right? So the conditions section will state policy provisions and these required of you. Um, so a common condition in a policy includes providing notice to the carrier within a defined period of time. So, you know, let's just say you have uh, your HOA, you got property damage, right? 
um, you know, you, you, you own these common areas. And so you, um, you one of your people are walking around and you notice maybe you have some playground equipment. It looks like somebody had set fire to your swing set. And you're like, oh goodness, when, you know, I, well, I need to make a claim, right? You know, or, you know, and so that would be, that'd be, you have to make a condition within a defined period of time. But what if one of your people just goes by it and um, sees the fire damage, but doesn't say anything to you. And then you wait a while and someone else sees it and then makes the claim. But then it turns out they do the insurance does the investigation says, well, you should have known uh, five months ago about this damage. You see conditions kind of are sort of like, but because you, you did not make the claim, we would have covered it had you made it during the, the, the period where your notice period, but you, you made it after the notice period, we're not going to cover you. I mean, these are like the uh, hallmarks of where litigation happens, insurance litigation happens, because then the, the policyholder always goes gets a lawyer and they, they try to squeeze something back out of the uh, carrier. And so those are conditions. So again, those are common elements of, uh, of a policy. You got your deck paid and definitions and your, uh, you know, your, your insuring agreements and your limits, your conditions. And of course, the final, the endorsement. So these are at the end. Um, and so um, sometimes they're referred to as riders. You know, a lot of times endorsements are you add in, uh, adding another person. You see this like an additional insured person. It's an endorsement that usually isn't at the front end. It's usually sometime midterm or towards the end. It's, uh, you know, a lot of times, again, it's an insurance may be used to add, delete, exclude, or otherwise alter coverage. So midway, you're like, um, you know what, uh, you know, we had five cars and I sold one. So we need to do a, uh, alteration here and, and, and delete one, you know, delete a car, right. Delete coverage, right. Or, um, you know, turns out that, uh, we've got some new board members. We need to add them to the coverage, right. So you see kind of what endorsement does. All right. So that is, let me see here. So let's see, I don't see any questions. But that is sort of the dissection of a common policy, right? And that's a lot. I mean, that, that's, that's a lot to ask of volunteers and such. But I think that it's important to know that if you have this piece of paper as a board member of either a neighborhood association or a uh, homeowner association, you still have a fiduciary duty to at least care that you a care that you have some policies that protect the organization because that is your goal, that is your fiduciary duty, and b at least have an understanding of with someone even gets you the papers, at least give you an idea of how to read these paper if uh, if you need to kind of figure out whether you know you're covered or not. But I but this next part, I think this is actually one of the more important aspects. Of, of of risk management and a lot of people who don't really think about it but I, from my i learned this really firsthand during my experience of being a nonprofit executive director for return to practicing law um, is working with an insurance broker or agent that knows your space and that's really good at what they do so principle one select a competent trustworthy advisor i mean Lawyers can know a lot, but I think brokers and agents, they understand the world of carriers. They know the different carriers. Um, and, and I think that if they have a good track record of representing HOAs, um, representing small nonprofits and neighborhood associations, they will know the common type of things that trip up said organizations. So this broker should be suited to your mission at this time in your organization's life. So you got some brokers who are better for startup nonprofits and some that are better for more mature organizations. So it's really good that, I mean, I think that when you do talk to an agent or broker, you need to get the uh, list of representative clients. You need to find out if they, if you're in an HOA and you're looking for someone, they better have a lot of HOA um, clients. Um, if you're in a neighborhood association and you're looking to get they at least need to know what a 501c3 is. They need to know a little bit about the nonprofit space. They should hopefully have at least, like I said, maybe they don't have a lot of neighborhood associations within, you know, as clients, but maybe they have um, some sort of smaller, you know, 
membership based nonprofits, maybe even a few churches or something like that might be a good one. Um, good things to notice. Your broker is responsive, answers questions in writing. What you don't want is just a broker who sees you as another, uh, you know, person to just claim a commission off of, and you don't see them at all until it's time for a renewal, right? You know, you, you want to like, you want to, you want to feel like your broker really gets what you're doing, and you'll know when, um, you know, you shoot them an email. Um, how long does it take them to respond to you? Um, you know, because that's that's really important. Um, the broker is respectful and professional, so this person doesn't say things like, well, nobody wants to insure your nonprofit, just leaves it that. They're not trying. They don't know. You know, I'll tell you this. If somebody says that nobody wants to insure your nonprofit, they don't know the space because there is somebody who will insure your nonprofit. Um, they're just lazy. Um, again, the broker meets with you off cycle, meaning that they'll come and meet with you. Many insurance agencies they're now souped up where they have different officers that can help you with various things. Some insurance carriers will have um, forms online and videos and things that can help your organization with your risk management or even, you know, some of these things have like bylaws and stuff you could download and write. I mean, there, there's a lot of them, but, you know, again, most important thing is they come to meet with you off cycle, that they're there to kind of see what's going on and how can I be of assistance and, how are things going? They're not just there. You know, if your renewal year runs October to October, it's not like, okay, I saw them in September and then I see them again the next September, right? When it's time for renewal, right? That's, you want to, because again, I've really come to believe that this is, with risk management, the cheapest and most, um, you know, but most important decision you're going to make is who you're utilizing as an insurance broker and agent. So, how are we going to vet this person? Particularly if you, you know, a lot of times you don't know what to ask. So let's talk about what, um, you know, how to vet your insurance agent broker. And I got this information from the Nonprofit Risk Management Center. So number one, you know, ask about brokers' claims handling capabilities, right? So, you know, what I mean by that is, so when you have to make a claim on the carrier, you know, you usually have to go to your agent, right? first. And so what is their capabilities for handling claims? You know, do they, do they just sort of, you know, can they handle them well? And what are their experiences? What you may ask them, what are some of the claims that you've, you've gotten from, you know, other HOAs? Or what are some of the claims you got from other neighborhood associations that you saw? And what did the carrier do? You know, you want to, uh, the more stories they have, the better. Um, you know, ask about your broker's experience with similar nonprofits. I think in the HOA space, find out if they are CIRMS credentialed agents. So there is, um, I have my notes, what CIRMS stands for. Um, I had it, uh, yeah. It stands for Community Insurance and Risk Management Specialist. So these are insurance agents who have de demonstrated a high level of competency within the community association risk management profession. Um, so if you can find a CIRMS credentialed insurance agent, if you're an HOA, that would be good because that person has put in a lot of thought, probably taken some kind of test and, and knows a little bit about your space. Um, ask your broker to be transparent about how they approach the market and how the broker is compensated by various carriers. You know, that was one thing I always kind of wondered when I got into the non-profit space, like all these agents, and I was like asking my CFO, I said, do we ever cut them a check? And says, well, no, because the carriers pay them, right? So you want to know why, you know, what is their cut from the carrier and is, 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 is that compensation making them want you to use a particular carrier? Because again, there could be a monetary interest for them you know, again, they aren't necessarily as bound by loyalty as a lawyer is to you, but I do think that, um, you know, you need to kind of know, like, what the carriers are paying them, and, and is, your, is your, um, your recommendation that we go with this carrier attached to how much commission you're getting from said carrier? Um, and, you know, does your broker provide high-level overview of current coverages and writing and upon request to committees or the general board? 
you know, you know, if, if you're, I think if your broker is willing to go to um, is, is excited or is in, interested in meeting with your board at your HOA or is interested in going to a board meeting of your neighborhood association to discuss your policy, that's a good sign that they're not, you know, that they're willing to, you know, because usually you do these things at night on a weekday or something. And if they'll come out to that, that's a good sign. They come and explain things. Um, does your broker make you rush to do anything but fail to respond to you in a timely manner? You know, everything should be an emergency. You want a broker that, you know, has, it's not their first rodeo. Um, and of course, this last bullet thing here, does your broker fail to tell you that a claim is covered or might be covered? This is very bad if so. I mean, this is, this is kind of like, you know, you could pay a lawyer to read your, uh, you know, read your policy and you can ask them that question and, 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 and things would start to run up. Remember, the broker gets paid off the commission. So hopefully your broker can tell you whether that claim is covered or not. You know, so again, I think when you meet with a potential broker, you, to whatever extent that you, your board and everybody can think of potential liabilities, things that could go wrong, you need to put them for your broker and they should know what types of coverage Will, will carry it and which carriers are best with said, you know, occurrences. So I think that's, um, so that, that's a key. All right. Um, and now uh, we'll get some miscellaneous things. We can go to some questions and answers. Um, this is a question that I, I get a lot. Um, and I, it's, it's uh, and this is something that uh, it seems to come up a lot with nonprofits is uh, just knowing what the difference between a certificate of insurance and an additional insured coverage, right? So maybe you have been involved in some kind of event with some sort of party and they wanted you to have a, a certificate of insurance. Well, so the certificate of insurance, it is, it is just a proof of insurance. That's all it really is. It's a, it's a piece of paper that the carrier, usually you go to your broker, your broker better know what a certificate of insurance is. Um, and basically, it's 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 just a it just says that this party is 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 insured right it's just a proof of insurance it's not an endorsement now you might be so because different groups that do business with you but particularly with your not with a nonprofit they may want to be an additional insured party so that's an endorsement right we talked about remember we went through the the we broke down the uh, the the, the, the par parts of the policy, the end was the endorsement. So let's say you're getting into something and someone says, well, we want to be named as an additional insured party um, under your policy. Then in order to make that happen, then you'd have to get additional insured coverage. So it's not proof of insurance. It's not a certificate of insurance. It would be an actual endorsement that you would add this person to your policy. So a lot of times people get these mixed up. I just kind of want to throw that out there. That's why I stuck it under miscellaneous. Um, hey, Rocky, can I jump in real quick? Um, yeah. our, um, our community grants program manager, she actually wanted me to talk about this a little bit for neighborhood organizations that want to do something, for example, like installing signage. And so the additional insurer that you just spoke about, um, CDOT and the city basically requires an encroachment agreement and that neighborhoods secure a $1 million general liability insurance policy when doing signage in the public right of way and the city needs to be named as an additional insured. And so that is something that typically trips up neighborhoods and um, they don't quite understand and sometimes get a little pushback when they're trying to um, secure this type of coverage. So she just wanted me to make that note for you all that um, as Rocky stated, that this is something that is required if you're yeah, going the city, to pursue. Yeah, the city ain't gonna like it if you come back with a certificate of insurance. <laughs> so that's why I kind of want to put that in there because they say we want additional insurance. They want to see an endorsement, you know, like, like I said, it'll be that, you know, an additional insured party being the city as, as part of your, your, your coverage. They, they don't want to. They don't want to just know you have insurance because so that's that might be because that does happen a lot. You know, the 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 party will come back with from the carriers and say, okay, I got what you need. So this is not what I need. This is a certificate of insurance. That means you're insured. We want to know that you're we're part of your insurance, and that would be the endorsement. So you're looking to get an endorsement that uh, says an additional insured um, party on your uh, the neighborhood association's um, 
you know, general uh, liability insurance. And again, the limits, you know, because then the city wants to know the limits are at a certain level too. And, you know, again, I think it's really important to have a, a broker that is really just keyed in on this space and knows these terms and has, you know, one question I would be, if you were a neighborhood association in Charlotte, ask him, have you ever worked in a neighborhood association that had to get insured um, or did business with the city of Charlotte? If they say yes, that's a good, you can give them a check, give them 10 points on your on the test. Um, because, you know, again, there's so many different brokers and not all brokers are, are, are the same. And so, you know, I think the more that they have experience with the type of uh, organizations that you are and a lot uh, and the type of uh, folks you'd be doing business with. So again, Neighborhood Association, City of Charlotte, at some point you will probably do business with the City of Charlotte in one way, shape or form. Um, so that would be, you know, an important, you know, important party there. Um, 